Welcome, everyone, to the Weinberg Group and webinar entitled Evaluating Product Risk in a Rapidly Changing Environment. All participant lines will be in a listen-only mode throughout the call. However, if you would like to submit a question or comment to the presenters, click the button marked Ask a Question on your event window and submit your question. All questions will be answered via email within a week of the presentation. To start, I would like to turn the conference over to Joel Falk. Thank you, sir. Please begin. Thank you, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, my name is Joel Falk, and I'm very pleased today to introduce today's session uh, entitled Evaluating Product Risk in a Rapidly Changing Environment. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by the Weinberg Group, which for the past 29 years has been a highly recognized regulatory and scientific consulting firm serving pharma, biotech, and device clients. Our headquarters are uh, located in Washington, D.C., uh, and we also have an office in San Francisco. Um, our speaker today is Matthew Weinberg, CEO of the Weinberg Group. Um, and since Matthew is my boss and signs my checks, uh, I want to make sure that this introduction does him justice, so um, here goes. Matthew uh, guides all of our strategic issues management client efforts with an emphasis on providing strategic and operational assistance to technically oriented entities in areas such as research and development, regulatory affairs, and quality assurance. Um, recently, uh, Matthew has been instrumental in organizing and growing uh, our GCP practice, which is um, becoming extremely successful in helping companies in reviewing uh, their, their clinical trial uh, work. Uh, Matthew's assignments have also included strategic development um, uh, of new products, testimony of the man on the management and economics of scientific enterprises, contract issues, and product development. Um, so, Matthew, how was that? Was that all right? That'll work. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, during the course of today's webinar, uh, you'll be able to submit questions uh, and we will, as, as you've heard before, try to answer as many of these questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Uh, if we're not able to get to all of your questions, we certainly will get to you uh, by email with all of these answers uh, within uh, a week. Um, and also, I would tell you now that the most commonly asked questions, um, most commonly asked question is, uh, will we be able to receive a copy of the presentation? Um, let me save time for all of you who are going to ask that. Uh, the answer is that everyone registered for this uh, webinar uh, will be sent a copy after the webinar is concluded, and actually we're posting them on our website as well. Uh, for those of you that are interested in some of our past webinars, I would also invite you to visit our website, um, which contains all of these past sessions on a variety of topics. So with that, um, let me turn this over to, uh, to Matthew. Thank you, Joel, and thanks for joining us today. The topic of this webinar was actually suggested to me by one of our clients, and we decided that we would do this because on a frequent basis, one of the most common questions we get asked by our clients are, we're under attack, what do we do? Or we expect to be under attack, what do we do? And so we thought that we would take a look at how one could evaluate product risk, prepare for it, before it occurs, but at the same time also present a model for dealing with attacks on the product when they actually do occur. And as you can see from this first slide, our, um, our process for this webinar is pretty simple. The first thing that we're going to do uh, is I'm going to give a little brief overview of the sorts of things I think people ought to be compared about, uh, concerned about. I'm going to talk a little bit about how one might prioritize, identify, and think about those threats. Uh, of course, no webinar would be complete about, uh, without some case studies and some actual places where we've dealt with this. And then uh, following that, uh, we'll have some best practices, really a one form of some of the things that we've distilled over the almost 30 years uh, that we've been doing this. Um, what I think is pretty important to grasp as part of this is um, I know one of the great things strategic consultants love to say is that every threat is an opportunity. You know what? I don't really believe that. Um, I think some things are actually just threats. 
and I think they have to be dealt with as threats, and I think that there are attacks upon your product that come from a lot of different places, and you have to be concerned about how to deal with them in order to be able to maintain market share, revenue, market position, uh, whatever your particular goal may be. It may even be just be um, to maintain the development path that your product is on. And so we're going to take a little bit of look and take some time to, to deal with those issues today, but, but that's where we're going to go. And in that vein, um, let's take a second and consider the landscape that all of our companies face, whether they are the most established company in the world that's been on the market for a couple of hundred years and has a steady stream of products, or you formed it yesterday and you have a brilliant idea for the next anti-cancer agent. Uh, the truth is that there are a whole raft of things out there that are attacks and likely risks to your uh, product and what I have noticed um, in the in the several multiple decades that I've been doing this uh, is that companies do a very funny thing when they do strategic planning or even development planning. Um, we've all seen the concept of the strength weakness sort of opportunities threats matrix, and everybody fills it out, but then nobody does anything with it. In in my experience and. I'm being a somewhat general. I'm sure that there are companies who do it. But generally, we tend to focus on our product strengths. And if we're lucky, maybe we strengthen a few of the weaknesses. But we don't always take the time to figure out where those threats are going to, are going to derail us and maybe plan for those in the future. And where those threats are going to come from are from the things that are highlighted on this page. Um, frequently and, and more and more often than you would expect, for example, um, you can get your product approved, but you can't get it on the market. Um, where you can't get it on the market at the price that you're interested in. Um, and, and those are the sorts of things that folks rarely don't think about when they're developing their product. By the same token, your product could have been on the market for five years, and all of a sudden some consumer group decides that it has appropriate data with which to attack uh, that. And I, and I point you towards baby shampoo. I point you towards... Uh, the BPA that was recently uh, uh, removed from baby bottles, there's a whole host of things out there that people point at and say to themselves, I don't like that anymore. And that's a threat that once you're established, you never thought of. So all of this is, is a constantly changing landscape. And a second problem that goes with it is that there's little homogeneity around the globe. And it doesn't matter these days um, where you sell your product, somebody is probably going to be out to get you. Um, and um, we read a story the other day around um, – we, we read a story we, – we read, we, read uh, we read a story the other day um, around um, a client uh, that's got an issue uh, because somebody in the financial community decided that they wanted to short sell the product and they started to put out bad news about that product. That's kind of an interesting, interesting dilemma that you, that clients have never really faced before. I think that's something in the past four or five years that, that we've seen. And so I think as we look at the environment in which we work, that's something that has to constantly be taken into uh, effect. And so um, this gets back to what I was talking about. When, when planning, when thinking about the development path, when considering where your product's going to go, you have to figure out which risk matters and which risk matters the most. There are a whole host of these issues. And anybody who runs a business, you know, I, I come to work every day and I always wonder what, what's going to happen to me today. You know, am I going to have, am I going to have today's the day some big client lands in our lap and we have to figure out precisely how we're going to deal with a doubling in our business, which I, you know, would never be against, but is obviously a risk to a business. Or is it the day some client decides that their product failed in phase two, and all of a sudden the work we had developing an NDA for them probably isn't going to happen. And so you have to figure out which risks you can balance and which you're going to move about. And so as we move forward, that's, that's where we want to go. And in order to do that, um, I, I think that the, the critical issue there is to be able to break risk um, into its component pieces. And hold on one second. I think I went over that slide. Sorry, I clicked a little too fast. So we want to be able to break risk into its component pieces. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, um, there are different issues that come to the fore when you're thinking about what risk is in the planning stage. Um, the first thing that we have to do in that is to look at our own particular corporate landscape. Um, we want to be able to understand um, is there a health impact? Is there an environmental impact? You know, what are we going to care about our most? 
Um, lately, for example, a lot of our clients are concerned about product disposal. How is the product going to be eliminated? If it's a drug, is it going to end up through excretions into the water system because that's a rising area of concern. If it's a consumer product and it has to be disposed of, how are we going to be able to dispose of that? And that's something that maybe 10 years ago nobody ever thought about, and today we have to think about. The second piece of that is we have to look at where this particular product falls into our own product portfolio. You know, is, is this going to be our A-list number one product? Um, if something happens to this product, do we need to defend it at all costs because it's the main piece of our revenue stream or it's in the center of the whole picket fence of products that we have? Um, do we need this product um, and we can't afford a significant hit to its price? Um, is there, you know, do we have, uh, do we have one supplier who gives us our key main ingredient and if that supplier comes under attack, what's going to happen to us? And those are the sorts of issues that we face every day, and as we, as we look at those in planning, we have to bring them down and begin to prioritize those risk factors. Now, as you look at this map, I want you to think about looking at it slightly differently. At least this is our perspective. And I want you to, instead of doing the normal strategic things that people put in here, I want you to think about how you might put science in on top of this. Because I think an, a missing link in traditional strategic planning and the traditional way people forget about this is the actual scientific attributes of the product. One of the things that we've discovered in, in the Weinberg Group's history is that we can make a case for our clients' products based on the science that underlies that product. And I think more and more we sometimes talk our way through this stuff without necessarily letting the data do the talking for us. And that's a pretty big deal. So... Um, as you look at this, I'd like to go back to the evaluate the corporate landscape and begin to think about, for example, how our science risk map would overlie this. What are the attributes of our product? What, is it ha what is its impact on human health? What's its impact on the environment? And, and I know that companies don't always look at this, and I think that's a mistake. I think that the more complete your product dossier is, the better you're going to be when it comes to making that product. And yes, there are those times when the company may discover something that forces them to go to the next generation or go on to another iteration of the product, but that's not a bad thing. That's the true new and improved. At the same time, you may discover things about your product that strengthen your market position, and that's a very advantageous thing. So instead of just sort of talking through this, I think you have to let the data settle into these different pieces. Same with the evaluate corporate position, please. If you're looking at your product portfolio and you understand the scientific nuances of your product, you know, what is its efficacy? What does it do? How strong is it? How well is the statistical data and what are we relying upon when we went for approval? It allows you to determine if you can have analogs to this product, whether you can use its own metabolites, whether there is other things you can build around it. And I'm not sure that companies, at least in my experience, do this as continually as they have to. And so... That's sort of my little piece on planning, um, and I actually think that planning around risk is an interesting concept. You can do it, and you can put in those plans, and you can think of what's going to happen when things happen, but the truth is that what you really need to do is to focus on what happens when you really are at risk. And so let's talk for a little longer time about doing. And the reason I, put, um, I started with this slide is because I think a lot of a lot of people and human nature is to look at the problem in front of us and try to solve the problem. And I'd like actually to start with a bit of a different heuristic about that. And that heuristic gets to figuring out where you want to be when you're done. You know, we, for years, have had something here called the Weinberg Way, which is we listen to our clients, but we ask some key questions that say to them, at the end of the day, where do you want to be when we're finished? What is the outcome that you're actually trying to achieve? And then we start to work on, given the data that our clients have, how do we achieve that outcome? So I would posit that when you find yourself under attack and, and you have one of these reasons where your product is at risk, you begin to think of what's the optimal outcome for your corporation and for your product. And when you do that, then if you want to do that, you have to figure out what if that risk then becomes reality. And if it does then we're going to present to you here a little bit of a model for ameliorating that risk, um, which includes some risk mapping, as I showed before, some science mapping, but also outcome mapping. I really want to focus on where do you need to go before you're done. 
then I would also do this. I think we live, a lot has been written, and I'm not going to belabor it, about how fast everything moves. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes happens to be that none of us operate in an emergency room. If you're an emergency room doctor, you have to react. We in the corporate world, we don't have to react instantly. We have to react quickly. And there's a gap between quickly and instantly. And I actually think that taking the time to take five or ten minutes or a day or two, depending on the situation, and think adds significant value to what you're trying to do. Um, you know, there's the old fight, fight or flight reflex, which makes perfect sense when lives are at risk. But generally, the kinds of threats and risks our clients face, our clients face, do not include lives at risk. Obviously, if they do, you have to do things completely differently. If there's a contaminant in the product, or if something like that, you have to think and move quickly, and you should have plans for that. I'm talking about when, you know, you discover that the regulatory path you thought was, you were going to take isn't quite there, or you're at a meeting with one of the regulatory agencies around the world, and they tell you something about your product you hadn't known. That requires thinking, and I actually believe thinking is a critical piece of risk response, and one that, unfortunately, I think is not done as often as possible. So I really want to want to take a moment and say you have to do that. And the last piece of this puzzle is to actually get the right people on the problem. This is not a compartmentalized issue. A lot of us work for companies that have multiple facets, and often internal politics get in the way. And no one likes to talk about this. It's not always that interesting. But I actually think a key issue in any successful model is to put together a cross-corporate group and let them figure out a response. And that cross-corporate group should probably not include senior management. Because if it includes senior management, then, then immediately politics plays a role. And I don't care how big or small your company is. I know this. I don't run the biggest of companies, but if I'm sitting in a room, it's a completely different discussion. That's just what happens when the CEO's in the room. So you want to have people in the room who have much, complete, uh, much more complete knowledge about the product. They understand the data. They know where the threat's coming from, and they understand its severity. And then by crossing corporate lines, by breaking down those inherent barriers, then the right story uh, can be told. And so... Step one for me in managing risk in a changing world is to let the right people deal with that risk when it presents itself so that when that first threat occurs, that we know what we're going to do about it. And, and I don't think this happens enough, quite frankly. I wish it happened more. And my reaction to this is based on the fact that we are frequently called in to help companies because they can't necessarily get out of their own ways. Now, from an economic perspective, that's good for the Weinberg Group, but it's probably not as good for our, our clients as it, as it could be. So the other thing you need to do, um, I think, in, in putting together a reaction model is you have to have data. You have to know where you want to go, and at the end of the day, you have to be able to figure out what data is going to take you there. And that's what I mean by data and an answer. you got to know what you have. You have to know where it's going to take you. Um, what kind of data has to start with where is the threat coming from? And that's where a little of the thinking comes in. You know, it may be, and I think a lot of times we react to a threat the same way we do a symptom, on, uh, a physiological symptom. So it, it may be um, that, you know, the, the blemish on your arm is a blemish. On the other hand, it could be the whorls from a, uh, from a tick if you've been out in the woods. But you have to understand the difference between the two. And when you have a threat coming at you, you have to be able to say to yourself, is that threat coming from something real, or is it because there's somebody who's trying to game my product? Going back to the issue I mentioned before, where we knew that in a particular case, a short seller was trying to engage a product um, so that they could actually derail its regulatory path, thereby enabling them to profit in the financial markets, you want to be able to understand the motive of somebody who's raising safety concerns about your or product. They may be legitimate. I'm not suggesting they're not. But they also may not be legitimate because somebody has a different goal. Another question is, what's being threatened? So let's talk about what being threatened, what's being threatened. You have to be careful to understand if what's being threatened is your company, the product, or the data behind it. And they're not necessarily the same thing. If the threat or risk is to a specific product, you have to ask your question, why this product and why now? 
is it being used as a showcase because it happens to be a big popular product and everybody wants to make noise about its ingredients because it helps those organizations gender publicity and possibly revenue. You want to be able to figure out if that threat is, is coming from a competitor because they're threatening your position in the market. They may not actually care about your product. They just want to be able to knock a couple of points off your market share because it's good for them. And if you can figure out that what they're at is our market position as opposed to our product, it also helps your response. You also have to figure out whose risk is at, at the most, um, at, at whose risk is the greatest. And by that I give you, for example, in the early days of uh, some of the AIDS treatment, and it's appropriate, there's a big AIDS conference here in Washington, D.C. this week, um, one of the things that effectively helped industry was that the AIDS community wanted those drugs passed. Um, some of the early drugs were really pushed through, for example, the FDA quicker because the community said, look, let's think about what's being at risk here. We're willing to take some drugs that may have some safety concerns because they may also save lives, a very legitimate cost-benefit ratio. So by figuring out whose risk was greatest, it wasn't the risk that maybe the wrong drug would be on the market. The risk was that people could die because the right drug wouldn't be on the market. And being able to harness the concept of uh, what risk matters most really helped move these drugs forward and got us to the point where we are today where there are really sophisticated drugs on the marketplace about this. Finally, you also have to know what's known about the product. And if you don't know enough, you better learn it fast. Um, it is stunning to me the n numbers of times our clients say to us, we don't have as complete a dossier as we should. And I know there are people out there who are saying to themselves, well, that's not me. And I'll tell you something that has amazed me. I, I joined this company in 1986. Um, and in that entire time, I've been stunned at the number of people who make the same mistakes people have done in the past. I would really ask yourselves the question, what do we know about our products? Do, do we have a complete dossier? Have we done the right data? Do we really understand the physiological impact of the products that we do up to the current state of the science? If you do, great. If you don't, I think it's time to develop some data because I promise you somebody else is doing it if your product is significant enough. Now, is that true for every product? No. You know, if you make some small product that, that is uh, used by an orphan community or, or it's an add-on to something else, maybe it's not worth it. But, but many times if it's a significant product in our market, somebody's looking at it besides you. And they're looking at it either because they want to take your market position or because they see it as a threat or because they're worried about what's going to do. There's an awful lot of researchers out there with a lot of time who are taking products apart and breaking them down so they can figure out what they do. Um, and, and I think that's important, and I've, I've harped repetitively on the company's goal, but I think <clears throat> you can't answer that if you don't know the answer to this. Right? Um, another thing, and I think that this is something that happens to many of our clients when they're under attack, is they forgot what got them to the market in the first place. Most of us, and I'd say virtually everybody of the multiple hundreds of people on this call, um, work for scientifically based companies. Yet when we're under attack or there's a risk to our product, we forget that it's the science that got us there. It's the science that put us in the market. And if you read your own mission statements, typically your mission statements say something like we're going to build off the inherent science knowledge in our company. Yet when attacked, we forget about that inherent science knowledge. We should trust our corporate strength. It is what gives us the product, and it's not what takes us through. We don't become brilliant um, public relations people overnight. We have always been solid scientists. And in the industries that the Weinberg Group serves, that's the core strength of the industry. To me, that's the answer to the, to the problem. Most of the people who are attacking us don't have science about our product as good as we do. And yet, it is completely ignored. So I would take my last bullet here says build a strength map, and I would go back to that risk map that I showed at the beginning, and I would begin to populate it with, again, what do you know about your product? What is the specifics of the science? What makes you smart? What is your strength? And I would put it to you there. And once you've done that, then I would begin to prioritize the strength factors of your product. So what I would do is I would take these, I won't, I won't, belabor them. You, you can see them up here and we'll send them out as Joel said. But I would take the knowledge about your product and I'd begin to rank it. I'd build a matrix. 
I begin to decide what's best about my product, what's worth about, worst about my product, where is my product strength. If you are an anti-cancer agent, and one of the things that you want to be able to figure out how to do um, is go into a new area of cancer in which there are existing clients and there's really a lot of noise about whether or not you're going to be permitted to, to do the studies you need to do that, you have to begin to build a very cogent argument as to why that's necessary. If you want to dethrone an existing, uh, existing market position of somebody else, you need to do that. If all of a sudden out of the left, and I don't mean that politically, I just mean off to the left, there's an attack on your product, you need to understand why. You know, is it from a consumer group who has, who has really begun to catalog adverse reactions to your product that you haven't seen? Um, is there a, uh, you know, we have a couple of clients um, who have begun to notice that folks out there are cataloging the adverse reaction data from the poison control centers. And our clients had not done them themselves, which means they didn't know the strengths and weaknesses of their own products. So once you begin to do that, you can then begin to figure out what's your potential effect on your revenue. You know, if you're a $50 million company, you have a $500,000 product, it may be easier to pull the product than to fight the problem. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying it's better for the corporation. It may not be scientifically justified, but it may not matter. You have, to, you have to judge that, and you can only do that by looking at the strengths of your product and figuring out what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and also what can you get done in the right time frame. You know, if, if you are attacked and that risk exists, you have to look at what's happening in the world around you and what's the time frame um, that in which you have to respond. Can you buy some time by putting out the appropriate statements about the safety of your product? Can you begin to engage consumer groups because that's one of the strongest strengths you have is turns out there's a whole satisfied community of customers out there or patients who are using your product and they're very happy about it. So when you know what works best for you, and this differs not client by client or company by company, but product by product. It's not the same for every product. Some products are better, some are stronger. You know, um, if, you, if you listen to direct-to-consumer ads, you can listen to all of the adverse uh, events that occur. And, you know, in the United States, it's required that we list them. But they're not all the same for every product. And so some are worse, some are better, some are more of greater concern, some are of lesser concern. Um, and you can only do that by, by building an effective map of what that is. And you do that then, then when you go to your public relations people, now you have a story to tell. And the thing that we know best about, about our world is that stories work best. And you can, that story can be constructed only when you have the data. So if you're under attack and if there's a risk, then you use your own data to tell that story. And if you've got that data built, then you know how to, uh, how to put that story together. You know, um, if you don't have the science, you're behind the curve. If you do have the science, you're not behind the curve. Um, so I, I'm not a PR expert. Um, I understand a little bit, as does the rest of the Weinberg Group, about social media, but there are people out there much smarter than us. But the one thing we've learned over the years is they keep turning to us and say, what can I say? And if you don't know, if you can't figure out when, uh, when the FDA or, or, or when the EU group says to you, hey, we think that your product is, is hurting people and you don't have a good answer for that, you're not going to get ahead. So you have to be able to figure that out. And if you lead with science, it's never a mercenary question. You're never doing this to protect a revenue stream. You're protecting the science behind your product, and that's a much safer place to be. So as I promised, now that I've, I've talked at you for almost 30 minutes here, um, what I'd like to do is to just talk about, take you through a couple of case studies, if I might. So the first case study was, <coughs> excuse me, that we, had a, we have a client <coughs> who had a broadly used chemical, um, and they're constantly targeted. Um, everybody's against this product on a regular basis. The number of times you read about it in the front section of the newspaper or you see it on one of the blogs is unbelievably frequent. And yet the product is pretty safe and effective, just people don't like it. So what are you going to do about it? Well, the first thing that we actually had our client do was stunningly enough do something they've never done. We gathered 100% of the literature that our client and began to read it and catalog it. We understood what studies had been done. We looked at which were peer-reviewed and which weren't. We looked at which were reproducible and which weren't. Um, we looked at whether or not emerging data, now that the product had more use, was greater than old data. We looked at whether or not there were differentials. And then what we did is we began to prepare for in advance the attacks that were going to become and actually prepare for our clients' fact sheets 
So the second that attack came, they could shut it down. And the truth is that, this was five years ago, five years later, our client's product is not under attack the way it was because we've been able to take all of those attacks and nip them at the bud using, as I said, the science of the product. It wasn't that we found some brilliant social media. We didn't even have an effective spokesman. We just made it not worth it for the client because there was an answer to every question they asked. And rather than being on the defensive, our client was actually able to be proactive and put together the list of their scientific attributes. The other thing was they also learned what was good and bad about their product, and they'd never really taken the time to do that before. So that's sort of my first example. Uh, my second uh, example, and for those of you in Europe, is under Reach, we had a client um, who was um, looking at the uh, sort of the removal of their product from the market. Um, they made a metal. Um, it's a common ingredient in a whole number of things. I imagine it's probably been used in the telephone you're listening to this from me today, or if you're looking at the screens on your monitor, I think that product's inherent in that. Um, and people were against it. And so the question was, how do we begin to justify this? Well, part of that was understanding, again, the, the reason and behind the attack. Using reach, um, people had to come after us because there's a whistleblower part of reach, there's a whole economic incentive piece of reach, and what we were able to do was use reach to our own advantage because we realized that there's a socioeconomic part to reach. And so we could demonstrate, for example, that if this metal were no longer in use, there was a massive socioeconomic impact that would be felt. There would be whole production entities that would have to be retooled. The cost of not, uh, the cost of not using it turned out to be the greater the cost of, of using it, and the science behind the product was pretty sound. It was hard to argue and demonstrate that the toxicity was what the other side said it was. And so after months of negotiation, our client was able to keep their product on the market, but it was based on the fact that we had looked at where the threat was coming from and what data could be used to underlie it. And my last example actually is a, a sort of a classic, which is that the FDA delayed market access. So we had a widely required, widely required and desired anti-cancer agent, but it was held up in the final stages of approval. Why? Well, because, and I've alluded to this before, but this is a different case, actually. It turns out that there was some guy who made all, it was a guy who made an awful lot of money short selling products who had decided that he was going to start raising noise about the safety issues of this product. And the whole reason he was doing it was because what he simply wanted to do was to get the stock of our client's company to fall. And once he figured out how to do that, he could short sell the product. And while this may not be legal, it's pretty hard to prove all of the time, but I think that it, it, it happens, and we actually know that happens because we've had more than one company attempt to hire us to do this. It's, of course, not something that we would do, but we know that it exists. Well, the trick here was to begin to publish the efficacy data, and we did work with the agency a little bit on this. They knew what we were doing, but we began to publish the, the results of our, st our studies, and we actually created a public compendium out there and a public outcry for our products so that we could really begin to think about, you know, should this product be in the market? And in essence, what we really did was we, we really befuddled the guy because we were able to keep the company's stock price where it was by demonstrating that their scientific methods were solid, that the data was solid, and that even though uh, approval had been delayed, it was likely to be granted, which was able to maintain their stock price, which thereby released the, released the pressure because after a while the, the short sellers gave up and our company's product was ultimately approved. And again, this it wasn't really a regulatory problem. It wasn't really a safety problem. It was because a threat was coming from somewhere, and by using the data inherent in our product, we were able to get a pass. So, so that's sort of our case examples. And then, as I promised, what I'd like to do is just highlight some best practices. Um, and they're, you know, to be highly repetitive, I'm going to do it again because, stunningly enough, I don't think this is something our clients do enough. Um, you have to understand the health issue around your product. You have to understand every nuance of how it works. And I think frequently we are so engaged in the approval process that we don't really learn enough about our product. We learn enough about it to get it approved. And sometimes we need to know more. Um, and maybe that comes post-approval, but you can't stop learning about your product. Secondly, I would constantly update real and potential risks because you're going to get them. I don't care where you work. And what you do, if this product is part of your arsenal and part of the armamentarium that you offer to patients, someone's going to be unhappy with you. We work with products that create physiological impact. And those products 
therefore are not always going to create the physiological impact that we desire. And given that that's the case, we ought to be account for the fact that sometimes there's going to be outcomes we didn't anticipate. We have to be ready for that. It's the whole reason we have pharmacovigilance. The whole reason we do this analysis is the question is we have it, what do we do about it? And only by being prepared will be we ready for it. Know your product's life cycle. As you're getting closer to the end, it's time to think about the next product. Think about where the analogs, metabolites, Think about what it does in the human body. You know, what happens to it as it's excreted? How do people dispose of it? If the containers are problematic, how are they disposed of? Because today, all of those issues matter. And if you haven't built a risk and scientific map for both of those, you're going to have problems. Um, and finally, without, when I said we'll send this out, um, the best approach for your company is to find that one which integrates public policy, the science, and the legal elements together. And we no longer live in a world in which the science, I believe it's the strength, but it isn't enough. We have to figure out how to take all of this together and package it in a way that lets us put together a comprehensive picture for our clients. That's why I went all the way back, if you remember, I said empower the cross-company groups. If you don't do that, then nothing's going to get done. If marketing can't talk effectively to regulatory to R&D in a, in a problem-solving risk amelioration mode, then the silos go up and, and you discover afterwards that, you know, you had data you didn't know about. So you have to constantly be figuring out how to put that picture together, which enables you then to, uh, uh, to, to put forth an appropriate response. So <clears throat> I know there are some questions, and I'll be happy to take them, but that's my picture of how you evaluate and deal with risk is to essentially put together in a comprehensive body of knowledge and use that knowledge to your best advantage. And with that, I, I thank you, and I'll answer the questions I know are out there. Joel, I think you have, you have to read them to me. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Thank you, Matthew. That was, that was actually very good and very informative. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and again, if we don't get to a specific question, uh, we'll certainly get back to you by email um, um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, I've gone through a couple of these questions, and I've actually whittled them down to about three. Um, and let me see if I can I can organize these. Um, Matthew, one of the first question I have here um, is uh, a statement uh, that I agree with that the challenges of moving products forward uh, include things like new government rules and guidances. Um, but my company has never faced a challenge from an NGO. Um, could you expand a bit on that aspect and what kinds of products hit the radar of the NGO and how would we or could we prepare for that? Well, first of all, let me say this. Lucky you. Um, and I hope it stays that way. Uh, so whoever sent that in, uh, let's hope that never happens. Um, I think the kinds of products that hit the surface of NGOs, and, and, I, and let me start with, I'll start with this. I absolutely have a bias. Um, I think a lot of NGOs are in this for their own revenue streams like we are. It's not to say that they don't have good aims. It's not to say they don't have good goals, but they look for high-profile products. They look for products at which making noise about those products will raise their own profiles. Now, clearly there are a lot of products that we have out there that are not necessarily great for the environment or may have adverse effects. Um, I think if you're under attack by an NGO, take a step back and figure out what it is they're really after. Are they after a bigger global stage and there's some ingredient that you can substitute for in your product? And if you can't substitute it, then the best thing to do, I actually think, is to begin entering negotiations with them. Figure out how to work something out. You know, if they're dead set at getting your product off the market, they can always make more noise than you can. And it's much harder for you to stop them. I won't say that it won't take forever, but if you look at the case, for example, of BPA in the United States, a product that to this day... There's limited data that indicate that it's harmful, and yet you can't find it in a whole raft of products because a bunch of people made noise getting, it to, getting um, companies to remove it, and companies removed it because it just was easier to do. And maybe sometimes that's your response. The other side is if, you're, if your ingredient is necessary, then I'd start talking to the NGOs to figure out what you can do. And the earlier you can get them to stop making loud noise, the better off you are. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, the second question that I have is, my company could spend a lot of time preparing for what eventually could be a non-event. Is there some way that we can determine ahead of time what kind of threats we could suffer 
what kinds of resources and information we would need, and whether or not we would need to be prepared before the potential event, or it might be able to wait until we actually see the, the threat more clearly. I guess that's a, just a question of being proactive or reactive. Um, so here's my answer. I think you can be constructively proactive without spending an awful lot of time. I think the question is perfectly, you know, as they all are, makes perfect sense. You don't want to spend a lot of time preparing for something that's never going to happen. Um, on the other hand, sometimes after you're attacked, you don't have time. So I think the things that you do in advance are to build a a dossier of what you know about your product in advance. So the, the more time that you can necessarily spend prepping yourself about you know what you, what you know about your product, that's useful. That helps you when the attack comes, and therefore it's something that you should do anyway, which will then enable you to do it. Maybe you don't have to know the attack strategies because the attack will never come. But if you don't know about your product, you'll never be able to come up with it afterwards. And once momentum is lost, it's really hard to regain it. Okay. And finally, the, the last question I have um, is, a, is a very interesting one. Uh, in the past, my company was involved in a massive recall of a popular drug product. The internal company strategies to protect the product never included the argument that the product had been reviewed and approved by the FDA. Do you believe that the FDA or any other government agency should be responsible for the regulated product that comes under attack? And if so, how would you handle that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, not that they're all, but that one that really puts me in the bell. I, I, I think that, one, that the government never bothers to step up and say, hey, we approve that. Because what they do is they say, we approve it based on your data. Um, I think the statements that I would make would be that the government reviewed our data and thought this product was acceptable for the market. And then I would go back to highlighting the acceptable data. Um, and, and in this vein, you know, a, uh, um, uh, a rational uh, question um, that gets asked in the same way um, is, you know, are there good products that are sometimes taken off the market? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, because in that same vein, um, the fact that the government won't stand up and defend your product for you sometimes means that, that you can't defend a product against the onslaught coming against you. I, I think the government ought to do it, um, but, you know, I, they don't really listen to me all that frequently, um, actually hardly at all, um, but that doesn't mean that they, that they shouldn't do it. And I think the government ought to say we approve this product. I think on an appropriate first offense is, Look, we went through the regulatory process. It's not a simple process, and the government said yes. And the same data that they used is available to you, and you ought to take a look at it. Um, I think that there are um, there are many products that are removed from the market for no good reason. I think, you know, I, I, as I said before, I'll point to this one. I, I look at the product BPA, for which there is limited data, but a lot of people don't like it. I think that there's been a fight against. Um, another metal, not the one I was talking about before, but the fight against nickel, um, which there are places in this world where you can't use nickel in se several products, but not for good reason. Um, we have seen lots of, re you know, there's a whole interesting debate about uh, whether or not the reduction, this is in America, of phosphates in dishwashing detergent <coughs> is necessary. And that's a pretty good debate. It was a good product. It's not clear that it was having the impact it was, but it's a high visibility thing, and, uh, and it's not clear that, that it should have been removed, but it was. And I don't think that it was defended particularly well. Um, we weren't engaged in that. Maybe the outcome would have been different. I'd like to think so, but it's hard to tell. A lot of noise made, a lot of well-funded NGOs out there attacking it. Okay. Okay, well, um, I, I think that wraps up um, – our time and uh, the questions, um, if we have any additional questions that come in, we, we certainly will get back to you. Um, uh, we will email uh, answers to all of these uh, within the next week. Um, I would also tell you, and, and there was one other question about a voiceover copy of the presentation, and that too is on our, our website. Um, so with that, I, I would like to thank everybody again for, for joining us. I hope the webinar was helpful. Uh, I thought it was extremely interesting. Um, and um, 
that's about it for today. Have uh, a great day, and uh, please join us for our next webinar. Thank you. This concludes the presentation. Before you log off, we would very much appreciate if you could please take a moment to complete a short evaluation form. Thank you for your participation.